Hi, my name is Tesney. Today, I want to talk about lifting furniture for Final Fantasy XIV housing on a controller. Lifting furniture can be tedious, time-consuming, and frustrating. But there are ways to make it easier. Understanding the glitch, having the right tools, knowing the item you want to lift, maybe even setting up your UI. When we leave housing mode, the game recalibrates every single item. That's how Lollafels get stuck in boxes, and also how we can trick the game into hovering pillars. If you've ever had a carefully placed window pop to a nearby partition when you left housing mode, this is why. That's essentially the glitch. Put a shelf-like surface near the item we want to lift, back out of housing immediately, and in that moment of chaos and spaghetti code where the game puts your house back together, it has to consider, should the wall go on this tiny shelf or on the floor? Obviously, it belongs on the tiny shelf. To get this glitch to work, the hitbox of the item you want to lift needs to be lined up with the platform of the shelf. For some items, it can be as simple as using a loft. Some items are royally tedious to lift. They have small hitboxes, making them harder to line up and only lift in small increments. But they look amazing in the air, so we are willing to do the work. Effects like these utilize every glitch in the book and a solid understanding of boundaries. Let's talk about the item you want to lift because they are different in all sorts of ways. Furnishing items have a hitbox in the center and that hitbox has its own size, which affects where the item can be placed. Rugs, beds, and big furniture have restrictions near pillars in some placed furniture. It feels like they have a wide hitbox, especially if you can't place it head on. In general, these items are easiest to get into the air. They can be lifted two grid snaps at a time, the height of one wooden loft. The downside is that beds, rugs, and clunky cabinets won't stay up in the air until they are up pretty high. Items like chairs, some tables, full-size partitions, and doors look more reliably at one grid snap increment, which is why I use factory grates. They are slightly smaller than the wooden loft, and their narrow height makes them stackable at one grid snap, and they can be placed more easily at those difficult perspectives and heavily decorated spaces. Check out this visibility. I love being able to see what I'm doing. The other extreme is tedium lifting. White rectangular partitions, wooden slab partitions, stage panels, which benefit from precision lifting from the tiniest shelf, the Riviera wall shelf. The lift area on the wall shelf is small, so only one, maybe two items will get lifted by it. However, they can be stacked a lot. So this is my go-to for lifting tedious items because I can get into a nice groove of place, 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 and remove, remove, remove. Other shelves like the mounted box shelf and the mounted cupboard shelf can be handy for weird spaces. The vertical height on these items is larger and they are longer than a wall shelf. The biggest downside to these, however, is they can't be stacked on one another. Personally, I'm more likely to readjust my lifting situation to make room for a sh wall shelf than I am to fetch my mounted box shelf from whichever retainer has them. But you won't find me without a wooden beam or three. When a wooden beam is used to lift a tedium partition, the beam travels with it. With that, I only need to find the right lifting spot once. And wooden beams are cool because they are a wall-mounted item that is also a wall surface. They can be built into a crane for moving tabletops and wall-mounted items into hard-to-reach places. Each item has its own minimum height requirement to float. To get a rug to stay up, it has to be lifted up to a certain point or it will fall back to the floor. The item must be lifted within its jump increment or it will not move, it might even fall. The shelf item must be placed from inventory, must come from inventory. Housing mode must be exited quickly every time. I use the options button instead of circle. If this process is interrupted too soon, the item will fall. The item must be locked into place by rotating it. Lock it into place every time. Locking an item into place can only be done in keyboard mouse mode. However, mouse and keyboard are not required. This can be done completely on controller, although having a USB mouse does make this process more bearable. The rotate feature is only available in keyboard mouse mode. Switching between controller and keyboard mouse mode can be done in character config. If you don't have a keyboard and a mouse, you can still use the controller to do many things in keyboard mode. Keyboard mouse mode has a menu down here, and we want to get the rotate button activated. If you're using a controller, you can rotate an item while using the move option. However, for the purpose of this glitch, rotating with this button is the only one that counts. 
I enable virtual mouse, hold L1, press R3, and use R3 to move the cursor. Tap L2 to select the button. Hold L1, press R3 to exit virtual mouse. An actual rotate of the item, select item, rotate, confirm, is not necessary. However, once the item is selected, it must be confirmed. Canceling out with the circle button or options menu will not lock it into place. This is locking in the item and it absolutely must be done every time. A lifted item doesn't even show up for other characters in the house until it's rotated. If you want to reset the instance to see how your lifted items line up together, the quickest way seems to be using the unending journey to trigger a cutscene and backing out of the cutscene as soon as possible. Using the go to front door option does not refresh the instance. To make switching modes a bit smoother, I created shared hotbars for config and housing. On controller, items can be placed by moving your character and changing your camera angle, and the item can be moved via ring placement, just like for placing ground effects, by holding R1 and moving L3. Ring placement speed can be adjusted, as can camera speed, if you're having problems with a certain lift. For glitching, I find that being head-on and level with the item I'm lifting is pretty important. It previews the loft item somewhat close to where I want it, and also minimizes the risk that the loft item will get snappy to the wrong wall. If an item is lifted too close to the ceiling, it will be sucked through. Tables and beds can't stay at Lollafell height, which is terrible. To work around this, I use a wooden loft or the top of an imitation wooden skylight to create a low platform that clips the furniture in the same way. Tabletop and wall-mounted items can be sunk into the floor using a scaffold of wooden beams. A maximum of 10 items can be moved at one time. I keep grid snap enabled whenever possible, and toggling on a controller is pressing triangle. It speeds up placing the loft surfaces and takes out the guesswork of how high I can jump the item. Tabletop and wall mounted items are linked to the surface they get attached to. However, they can be unlinked by disabling counter placement. I click on the wall, click on the window, cancel, then draw away the wall from the window. Or table, same idea. This is how I get things into harp to reach places, sinking a table at top item into the ground or putting a vase on a harpsichord, which isn't actually a table surface. Boundaries. The walls, pillars, and stairs have tight boundaries. Some of these boundaries can be circumvented by placing the item directly from storage. When the item is placed from inventory, the subcommand menu is short and limited. When an item is placed from storage, the subcommand menu has more options, including the place option. Hitting X here will get you the error message beep. Hitting square to bring up the subcommand menu and hitting square again gets the items placed. That's it, no keybinds or settings to change. From here, there's actually two ways to execute this glitch. The first is using item preview, which places an item right in front of your feet and execute place. This method is clunky, however, in some situations. When you're really serious about getting that item as close to the pillar as possible, or when there's just no visibility, or even when a big clunky item will do a freak out when you try to move it on the cursor. You can place these items directly as they're previewed. The second way is to use the in-game cursor. From the item preview, hit X to enable movement and adjust the item before using the subcommand place. It's the exact same result, but they allow us to circumvent the boundaries in different ways. Some items can't be previewed in stairwells, but if you run to the stairwell with it previewed, the item can still be placed with the subcommand place. Pillars are firm with their boundaries and feel awkward to work around. Many decorators block off their spaces generously, so they never need to worry about squeezing an item near a pillar or door. Wall-to-wall -wall decoration is actually wall-to-wall -wall frustration. Each stair, and in some places the tops of pillars, have its own height, which creates a tricky zone on the stairwells here, where the minimum height requirement for tall items is still pretty high up. The stairs have a lot of boundaries that can be painful to work around. I have tried a few rather grand ideas that never work out that well in execution because of all these dead zones. Items lifted through railings and stairs will get sucked up to those heights. This can be helpful to speed up lifting, but places some hard limits on what can be placed around pillars. This indoor pond isn't lifted. It's actually on the stair here, placed from inside the stairwell with a direct place from storage. When I'm lifting from below, I measure using the same floor type, usually marble because of the handy grid it creates on both floors to create reference points. I also use red carpets. 
If I'm unsure about a hard to glitch item, I'll quick lift a tall, easy item to check edges and placement above. These floors and walls were a whole lot of glitching, so I tried to place them in a way that I'd use them for future builds as well. The most annoying part of decorating out of bounds is that the item can't be moved around, only rotated and only in keyboard mode. The item must go back into storage and the process begins all over again. Navigating with controller. When housing mode is entered, the active cursor defaults to inventory. From there, you can hit circle one time and back out of the menu and use left and right direction arrows to toggle between items in front of you. Or you can, with the active cursor in inventory, hold R2 or L2 and hit one of those side direction arrows to select the item in front of you and cycle through nearby items. Selecting items in the open space before you can be straightforward or tricky, especially when the hitbox of your item is actually in the basement. It takes some practice, but moving the character and camera angle can minimize toggling, but the more a space is decorated, the harder it gets. When the cursor is active in the storage menu, using R2 and L2 will toggle between storage and placed menus. R1 and L1 toggle between categories. I toggle between menus with the big rectangular button but I also had to disable the mouse feature on the big rectangular button. When in controller mode, one can select an item from the place storage menu to preview it and hit X again to enable moving the item. In keyboard mouse mode, selecting the item previews it, but the active cursor remains in the menu. So hitting X again refreshes the preview. To get to where you can move the item, hit X to preview the item, hit circle one time to back out of the window and hit X again. In any mode, when you use a USB mouse to initiate placement of an item, you can also use the controller to change your location and angle, but the ring placement feature does not work, and the final click to place the item has to come from the mouse. If the mouse cursor is too close to interface gunk, the item won't place or move. If an item is placed with a controller, same deal, the mouse cursor does not move the item and it will not place the item either. At least you can ignore the interface gunk with a controller. Wall-mounted glitching. The first imitation windows introduced to the game can only be applied to partitions by placing directly from storage. However, you can drift a window from the main wall to a thin partition like a stage panel by placing them close together. This is a drawback though, as wall-mounted items will snap to a nearby wall if placed too close and at the same angle. This can be circumvented in your designs by using things that aren't walls the backs of white screens or maps, cabinets, bookshelves, or even by flipping the wall-mounted item around itself, which will keep it from snapping to stage panels at the very least. Collision. We can manipulate collision of the ceiling, stairs, and stairwells by using certain items that pull us through or in. Beds can move a person across or down, and some items will force you up through them, like the wooden table, five ages, and oriental bathtub. They'll ignore the ceiling boundary. I have never been able to get the slash doze to work from a bed placed outside the stairwell, so I usually find another way into the stairwell initially and put a bed inside. The slash doze command works reliably from on top of the middle of the bed, in my experience. However, doze through stairs is easily interrupted by other furniture placed nearby, so if you can, decorate your stairwells last. Hiding a bed or chair inside of another piece of furniture also influences the collision of the item around it. Emotes like slash doze and slash sit will place your character laying down or chair sitting on the loft or other furniture. Camera collision can be made for false ceilings. To prevent someone's camera from zooming past the false ceiling in a very unpleasant and disorienting view, items like beds or the indoor pond can be hidden above the ceiling. A character can force item collision by running at certain angles and points, which can allow you to escape your latest creation or simply take a peek at how someone built their house. I'm guilty, okay? So guilty. Custom floors and ceilings. Marble alcove beds and marble partitions lifted from the floor below create this false floor. Marble beds and partitions snap at one grid snap, so they're easiest to lift and lock into place at a fairly low height, so they can be used in an entryway without getting anyone stuck. Another dozen of these or so, and you have a beautiful ceiling.
<laughs> Wooden skylights have a huge platform and no undiable edges, so they are my new favorite for lofts and fake walls. They look really nice. Combed wool rugs and wooden flooring are both easy to lift and flooring is cheap, albeit shiny when placed near the light fixture. They have a high height requirement, however, so they can only be flooring for taller lofts. Red carpets can also look very nice, but their narrow size means more are needed and that can add to your overall item count. Many cabinets, counters, and bookshelves can be lifted to create trims and other edges. Details like these are the ones that make a room feel finished, but hyper decorations and crazy custom features devour the item count, and many take up space behind or around the feature, blocking off even more space. The item count limit happens before you're ready. It doesn't matter what size, before you know it, you have 37 rectangular partitions and 14 wooden floorings, none of which are on the floor, and your house might still feel empty. This build is 270 items out of 300. The basement and upstairs are completely blocked off, and I'm not even done with the dining room yet. There are a handful of things I could do to free up items, but I think I just need to block off even more space. My house is never done. Housing is a void. It seems like you're getting space when you buy a house but you're actually creating a black hole that sucks up all your gill and time. Good thing it's fun, and I hope I've made it a little more fun for you as well. Thanks for watching.